Hi everyone, my name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to the 32nd in our webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Wind Forum Type Service Facility and SOSA Alignment with Objectives. Uh, I'll do a, a little uh, administrative uh, introduction first, and then I'll turn it over to the presenters. So first, uh, the slides presented during the webinar are going to be posted on our webinars page. It's www.wirelessinnovation.org/webinars. Uh, we're also recording today's webinar, and you'll be able to find the recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, that link will also be on the webinars page. So you can again go to wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars and find uh, find the link to the YouTube channel there. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to contact me directly at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org uh, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, one thing to note uh, today, in question, uh, there's two ways of, of doing it. First is uh, there's a questions window. Please type your question into the questions window and uh, we'll be presenting them uh, to the speakers along the way. And then second, uh, there should be a little hand button on your interface. If you click that, that will raise your hand and that indicates that you want your microphone turned on. Uh, I'll uh, let the moderator know, and then we'll turn your microphone on, and you can ask your question that way. Uh, note on international participation. Uh, the forum's an international organization, and there are international participants in this webinar. So uh, please uh, bear that in mind uh, when you're asking your questions. Uh, don't disclose anything that's export restricted or just or uh, controlled during the uh, webinar. We actually have a policy on restricted and controlled information, uh, SDRF policy 009 that's available on the web. And so if you need additional information on prohibitions, uh, please refer to that. With that, I'm gonna to introduce today's moderator. Uh, that's Ken Dingman. Ken is with L3 Harris, where he's a senior engineering manager uh, responsible for HF uh, narrowband LOS and SATCOM waveform applications in the Falcon 3 family of radios. He's also the chair of the WinForm Software Defined uh, uh, Systems Committee, uh, co-chair of, of that committee. So Ken, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Lee. Um, so joining me today, and I wanna thank everybody online uh, for joining us today. And joining me today, we have um, three people that are gonna Uh, the first presenter today is, today is going to be Eric Nicolay. Eric is from Talis and is located um, outside of Paris, France. He will be discussing the WinForms facilities approach. Um, it's a, kind of a standard mechanism that we've developed within our committee. Your mic's breaking up a bit. Okay. Um, the standard approach that we've taken within our committee for developing standards. So Eric will go through that and that'll give you the foundation for how the time service facility has been laid out and so that you can understand the mechanism and the structure of time service facility as well. Uh, doing the majority of the presentation is gonna be David Haygood. David is from Sinisher and he will be leading, he will be leading the uh, discussion and presenting the time service facility APIs. And joining him will be Chuck Lynn. Uh, Chuck is also from L3 Harris. Chuck will be joining David, especially during the discussion portion at the end of the, of the, of the presentation. So the structure of the presentation is going to be Eric Nicolay will lead off with an overview of, of the time service facility approach. And then David Haygood uh, will describe the time service and specifically, and then we'll have an open time for discussion. And regarding more, more or less, that'll be focused on the integration opportunities, the way we way that the time service could be used uh, within the system. So with that, I will pass it off to Eric. One second, Eric, and I'll get your slides up. Yep. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, uh, I believe you're good to go. Please uh, just let me know when you need me to advance your slides. 
Okay, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to report on these uh, wind forum facility principles that we have been following in developing those uh, facilities specifications. So uh, we can go to the next uh, to the next slide. So, our first some words of uh, introduction. Uh, then uh, rapidly we're going to uh, we're going to discuss the. Uh, report on the content of two main documents. The first one is the principles for wind farm facility standards and the second one is a wind farm facility PISM mapping rules and so the uh, essence of the brief is to give a uh, to give a, an overview of each of those two main documents. Next please. So uh, the bottom line of this brief before we enter uh, with Dave and check on the details of the two specs we've been working on is to uh, share you this formally structured framework we are using to develop the facility specification. Of course, it is evolving as we uh, develop further facilities, but we have something quite solid and that's what we want to, uh, to share with you. And uh, as uh, introduced, two technical reports capture this structure. Uh, the technical report uh, 2007, Principles for Informed Facility Standards, and the uh, technical report 2008, Wind Forum Facility PISM Mapping Rules, and they are consistent with the two facilities we finalized at the beginning of uh, 2022, the transceiver facility and the time service facility. Next, please. So, uh, the first document uh, is so-called Principles for Wind Forum Facility Standards. Uh, it's uh, dated uh, October 2020, it's uh, crisp, 13 pages, it's a technical report, it is not a standard per se, and it sets the reference count sets for a specification of wind forum facilities, or at, or at least let's say 80% of what we are using is captured and introduced correctly, hopefully, in this document. There may be a remaining 20% that is appearing in the facilities without having been clearly defined here. But that's giving pretty much a good view of what we are doing in the facilities anyway. Next, please. So the introduction of the, uh, of the document captures uh, what we are talking about. So facilities are addressing so-called functional support capabilities, e.g. transceiver, timing service, audio, capabilities of the, uh, of, uh, of the radio. Uh, they are addressing it using a service-oriented approach, we're going to detail, uh, following the uh, Object Management Group uh, MDA, Model Driven Architecture Paradigm, uh, that we uh, materialized in the following way. First, specification of one PIM specification, so platform independent model specification, and uh, supplemented by a number of PISM, platform specific model uh, specifications. Uh, what we are doing is that we specify the services uh, with the associated APIs and attributes. It's not just software interfaces, it's, not, uh, it's more than that. We we'll really uh, focus in specifying the entirety of the uh, expected services. Um, and what we had as well is, uh, is uh, as far as SDR standards are concerned, let's say, a uh, flexibility and scalability approach that uh, that is enabled thanks to a formalized optionality model that is unprecedented in the uh, pre-existing specs. A quite rigorous way to identify the options and, and play with them, let's say. Um, for the remainder of this brief, uh, the things uh, like the one you see at the bottom left uh, in, the, in the, this uh, red rectangle are uh, specific quotes from the document. Then the figures you see on the right are extracts as well of the figures of the document. And so what I just said is summarized by the picture we have on the right. So a wind farm facility is focusing on a certain functional support capability in green. It is specifying its uh, uh, service interfaces towards the uh, radio applications. And it is uh, specifying as well a number of attributes. And since the stuff is service oriented for a given functional support capability, it is specifying things on a service by service basis. And here you have an example with N uh, elementary uh, service interfaces for as many elementary services inside the functional support capability. Next. So uh, more about the general uh, SDR related general principles we are dealing with. First one is that the concept of radio capability. 
A radio capability is defined as a capability available in a radio product based on over-the-air radio operation. So it can be transmit-receive, transmit-only, receive-only. And I'd like to say it's more than just radio. It is really transmit in the sense we are radiating something. A jammer could be considered a radio capability. The receive-only means that an uh, EW sensor uh, can also be considered as a radio capability that has to really be taken in a general sense here, not just waveforms. Of course, our focus has to do with waveforms, uh, and it might reflect on what we are doing. Uh, but the bottom line is really that radio capabilities need to be taken in a general sense. But having said that, uh, a number of software-defined radio essential concepts. First, the fact we define a software-defined radio as a radio that implements radio capabilities through execution of software applications. And a radio application is defined as a software application instance that implements a certain radio capability within a software-defined radio. And the radio platform is defined as the hardware and software environment, uh, the, cra the software cradle, if you will, provided by a software-defined radio for execution of radio applications. And that's the bottom line of what we you see on the uh, on the picture on the right hand side, and that's independent from the fact we would have standards between the radio apps and radio platform. What comes in with the WinForum facilities is that we are standardizing things around the radio platform for two uh, reasons: to promote and improve uh, portability, and the second reason is to improve hospitality. So what are those animals about? So for portability concept uh, is defined uh, as the, for a given radio application, as the level of reduction of effort in having an existing radio app running on new radio platform. That's, that's really this concept you do. You have a radio application running on one radio, you want to have it run on another radio, and having a good portability level is that you have decently reduced the level of effort to integrate this radio app on the next uh, on the next platform uh, the second concept is let's say the uh, the dual concept about that it's the concept of hospitality uh, meaning that a given radio platform uh, you have a good level of hospitality if uh, you have a good level of reduction uh, in the effort it takes to have the a, a given a certain radio application running on the said radio platform. Could it be a, a brand new radio application? Could it be something that is ported uh, from another? Uh, that's this uh, second concept of hospitality. And the reason why we work on standards between radio apps and radio platform is to improve the portability of radio apps and the hospitality of radio platforms. Next, please. Uh, what we are talking about as well, in terms of architecture concepts now, is that we are talking about component-based radio applications. Uh, so component-based uh, in the sense that uh, an application component is one software component of a given radio app. And uh, we introduce as well the concept of processing nodes uh, as a processor of the radio platform that is capable to execute application components. You might have others, but those we call processing nodes are nodes, sorry, are those uh, which are capable to execute some application components. And part of our challenge is to address a large variety of processing nodes, general purpose processors, DSPs, FPGAs, and that's part of the rationale behind this PIM slash PISM approach uh, to, uh, to specify things independently from the processing node environment we work on and then migrate uh, towards uh, implementation in adding some uh, processing node specific uh, implementation assumptions. Next, please. Now, two essential concepts when we look at what the radio platform provides. First, the concept of software support. Uh, the software support is defined as the capabilities provided by the radio platform that enable execution of application components uh, throughout the available processing nodes. So that's really the idea of a software environment and uh, the key constituents of this uh, uh, software platform are typically scheduling capabilities, connectivity capabilities, e.g. Cobra or whatever middleware, or uh, components handling, uh, typically an SCA core framework or component model handling. That, that's the, uh, so, sorry, the component handling is the way 
you are able to play with the components, each obey to a certain component model, and this component handling capability of your software environment is enabling you to install the install, connect together, configure those application components. At the end of the day, we have not said radio here. All those stuff could be a quite advanced coffee machine. Uh, what we are simply talking here is uh, the fact we have something with software inside, distributed software on heterogeneous processing nodes, and with some tough real-time constraints to deal with. The counterpart to the software support is on the next slide is the so-called uh, functional support. We, yeah. So functional support in the general sense uh, is the whole set of capabilities a radio platform that provides spe which provides specific functionalities to the radio domain in support of application components. Uh, so this functional support uh, is decomposed into a number of elementary functional support capabilities and that's the granularity we are working at for each facility. Uh, and uh, those functional support capability are defined as uh, the elementary capability, one elementary capability of the functional support. So uh, examples uh, of functional support capabilities, as already mentioned, transceiver is one, time service is another one, the audio is another one we currently work and uh, going one step further having said that we introduced the concept of facade the concept of facade and you can uh, figure this out using the figure on the right is defined as uh, the software segment of a functional support capability implementation that executes on a given processing nodes and uh, this concept is fundamental in order to deambigrate uh, situations where you have for instance a given functional support capability, such as functional support capability one on the rear right, that has two facades since it is exhibiting a software interfaces on two different processing nodes. And this contributes to the same functional support capability implementation. And uh, that's a, an advanced case. Of course, the most trivial case is the case where you only have a single facade on one processing node, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, each facade, since it is executing within a processing node, will be accessible by the related application components using a certain access paradigm. So uh, the access paradigm, you have a definition, is the software mechanisms that enable an application component to access to a facade within the concerned processing nodes. And the software support of the previous slide is not what we're addressing, but definitely what facilities address uh, are the uh, functional support capabilities. Next, please. And when we enter into that, uh, we uh, add a number of additional uh, concepts. So the concept of service. So we made our own definition of service because it can mean so many different things. So here uh, in our environment, a service is defined as one elementary capability provided by a functional support capability to radio app with a certain service name. And uh, a service implementation then for a given functional support capability, it is defined as one implementation of a particular service by a particular facet. That's a, a service implementation. And the service interface is defined as a software interface presented by a service to the radio apps uh, employing it. We have a very fundamental structural assumption that is facilitating life, perhaps creating constraints, but that's the one we've been using so far, that consists in saying, for what we call a service, it is attached to one interface. Uh, it is a very strong structural assumption, uh, but in our verbiage, one interface in the IDL sense or the UIML sense, that is a collection of primitive. Uh, this collection, consistent collection of primitive, uh, is what we consider as being the software interface uh, attached to a certain service. Um, the other important point conveyed here, I insist on, is that WinForm facilities are not only specified the software interfaces of service, but they uh, specify the entire associated capability, including the attributes, the behavior, the, the, the whatsoever. Uh, so it's not just a, a question to plug components together, it's to make sure that they interoperate so that the radio app will correctly work uh, with uh, the functional support capability it uses. Next, please. 
Then we followed, and here I'm not entering the luxury of details, we have the concept of provide a new service, which are the, the concepts used to characterize the direction, the orientation of the service. They provide services, something that is provided by the platform, so basically used by the radio app, that the most co that's the most common flavor of service, for sure. And then we have the concept of a use service, which is the other direction. Uh, there is a service that is uh, called by the platform towards the radio application. The concept of services group is a classifier that is enabling to group uh, services together for a given uh, for a given uh, functional support capability. And then we have the concept of primitive and primitive implementation with a number of classical concepts uh, listed in the square rectangle at the bottom. So the concept of signature, the concept of parameter, the concept of direction for each of the parameters, in, out, in, out, the concept of semantics of the parameters, uh, uh, of the primitives, the concept of type, the concept of exception. Uh, that's the basic palette of uh, software concepts we are using. Uh, at the PIM level, and we are then transcribing at the PISM level. Next. Um, maybe the last one, uh, a flavor of the real-time concepts introduced. We are quite accurate on real-time concepts, not meaning that any of those real-time concepts needs to be used uh, depending on the problem you face. But here again, the idea is to have a strong vocabulary to address uh, uh, as many problems we would uh, we, we would face. So the first time, real time real concepts we are uh, defining and then using is the concept of call time and return, return time for a primitive measured at the radio app level. Uh, uh, sorry, at the uh, functional support item level. You see the small diagonals on the uh, on the right uh, in the picture um, with the corresponding notations. And then it enables to introduce uh, the worst case execution time, uh, which is uh, defined uh, as the maximum time taken by the implementation between a call time and return time. That's for the provide services and on the other direction, that's what you have on the, uh, the right-hand side of the picture. We have the concept of WCEET, lots of discussion to agree on the term. It's a worst case external execution time to uh, characterize uh, for a primitive implementation of a use service, the maximum time supported by the implementation between T call and T return, uh, still orienting the, the concept on the green side. So from the green side, it is an external execution time, therefore the name we have in that case. I think that closes this introduction to the foundational concept. Let's check out even going to the next slide. Oh, no, I, sorry, my bad. So we are as well uh, specifying facility attributes, so in the object-oriented meaning. So uh, a facility attributes is really fine as simply as possible as an object-oriented attribute of a functional support capability. That conditions its correct joint execution with a radio app. Every word is meaningful here, uh, meaning that we have examples and counter examples. An example of facility attribute is the set of supported services. Out of this breadth of services, this is this, this, and this service that is activated or supported. And I have replicated twice this service. Then some behavioral options can be characterized as Boolean uh, attributes. The transfer function between the IQ samples of a transceiver and the antenna is also uh, characterized thanks to a mask that is defined using attributes. The real-time performance values uh, features for any of the real-time parameters you've seen earlier, for instance, for a given implementation is also characterized using attributes. Counter examples that has to do with uh, which have to do with the end of the of the definition are the swap of implementations. Size, weight, and power features have nothing to do with the uh, facility attributes. Uh, and more generally, any feature that has no impact on radio application is something we did not bother uh, uh, specifying an attribute for. So and that's the general concept of attribute uh, applied in our environment. And then uh, we identify uh, three flavors of such attributes, capabilities, properties, and variables. It has to do with their lifetime, stability lifetime. Capability is an attribute that is constant over the lifetime of a certain functional support capability implement. A property is an attribute that is constant over the configured state 
uh, of uh, an implementation, but that may vary from one configured state to another. And a variable is something that varies so much that even when you are in the configured state, that is to say the runtime of the app, uh, the value of the attribute might change. Next, please. And uh, yeah, that's probably the last one with the uh, this time with the facility composition. So one PIM spec and uh, several PRISM specs. So the PIM spec uh, is a spec that answers to uh, the following uh, to the to a certain definition of the ONG. I'm not going to enter into the details. Time is running. Um, and uh, and the PRISM spec is the second flavor of specs that is starting from the ping and mapping the software interfaces and the attributes and essentially the software interfaces into a certain applicable programming paradigm or access paradigm typically suitable for uh, dsps fpga or gpps and as you will see our prisms so far cover the following programming paradigms sca native c plus plus and fpga and that makes a transition to the next document. Next slide. The next document is this uh, uh, report called WinForum Facility PISMS Mapping Rules. And it is uh, specifying the mapping rules from the PIM software interfaces and other concepts uh, uh, to the different programming paradigms. You see the three flavors, I already mentioned them. This document captures the mapping rules for those uh, three uh, paradigms into the same doc. Uh, it was approved uh, in uh, early 2022. There is a mistake in the slide. It is uh, already approved. It's not in approval anymore. Uh, next slide. So uh, the document is starting with some uh, reference architectural pattern that has to do with uh, what we already exposed that you see uh, here. The service interfaces of the API within a processing node are assumed to be between the facade on the right and a certain application component using the service interface uh, to access to the facade. And the facade belongs to the implementation of a service that might be entirely localized in the processing node, purely software, uh, uh, be the facade plus some hardware, that's really the common case, and maybe having some other facades involved. Uh, for distributed services, it might be the case. Um, so uh, you have here a number of uh, of things, but I believe that there is no uh, no need at this brief to go into the details of the concepts on the on the left. So let's go to the next slide. And here my goal is not to uh, to enter Eric, into the it. Yep, I was thinking for the sake of. Yeah. Maybe we could break here and move to the. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ken, your microphone's not working. Yeah, I understood that Ken was pushing to go faster or perhaps to skip. I, so, um, so here you have the brief. You will be able to review it. Uh, so this is this uh, view cell is just presenting uh, an overview of the uh, native C plus plus. The next one. We we'll go to the next one. Yeah, uh, is introducing the DC++ specific concept of the facade class that is enabling to provide a mechanism to connect things out, uh, because the native C++ mapping is uh, uh, only proposing the the, uh, the the transcription in C++ of the uh, PIM interfaces. So we are we are missing a connection mechanism, and this facade class is proposing these connection mechanisms uh, with two flavors. I'm not going to enter into the details. The, set, the next slide, yeah, is uh, detailing the fact that within the facade class for C++, there are two ways to connect, a so-called explicit way or a so-called generic uh, way to access to the services using the facade class. Um, and, uh, and all the rest of the mapping rules have to do with how do you map uh, things from uh, IDL or equivalent to native C++, uh, very much inspired, of course, from the uh, OMG uh, uh, IDL mapping rules. Next, please, is a quick overview on the SCA stuff. 
So same sort of overview. So the long range is changing, but the same pattern is used. Next, please. Uh, just to with this slide and the next one that uh, we are uh, specified two uh, two uh, management interfaces two versions of management interfaces have been specified out those corresponding to SCA triple two and those which is on the next slide corresponding to the SCA four point one management interfaces and beyond that uh, those are the essential uh, added value things i would say in the prism compared to the uh, to the trivial mapping uh, mapping stories uh, which are specified anyway then uh, regarding rtl fpga going to the next one so here the overview is that uh, we are within an fpga node and inside this FPGA node, we have some RTL uh, interfaces between the FPGA applicative module and the FPGA facade. That's the model we're following. Oh, no. yep. And then what we specify in the mapping rules are families of RTL signals then used when building the specific prisms to create the RTL interfaces, a number of structural RTL signals with the clock, the reset one, a number of semantic support RTL signal with uh, the enable kind of stuff, the ready kind of stuff, and then the parameters dependent RTL signals with the enable uh, in and out of, of those depending on their uh, uh, or their direction plus the related uh, uh, bit fields uh, um, or wires uh, packet for uh, for the corresponding parameters. And I guess that's it, Ken. Okay, thank, thank you, Eric. Yep. And so we will move on now to David Haygood, who will be presenting the specifics of the time service facility. And a reminder, if you have any questions as David is going through this, uh, feel free to ask them as we mentioned Raise your hand and type them in. So uh, we have gotten one question, and uh, maybe it'll be addressed by uh, David and Chuck when they get into theirs. The question that came in is the title of the presentation was social, social alignment, but I don't see any victory time service messages exposed yet. Did I miss it? Victory is now SOSA adopted. And, and the short answer is we'll get there in a moment. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So, let's see. This one. Okay, I believe your slides are ready to go, Chuck yeah. or uh, David. Okay. So, uh, now we're going to get into the specifics of the time service. All that preliminary was how do we define services in a generic fashion and then map them into a specific environment? And we are concerned about that in the forum because there's lots of ways to implement a radio. There's the SCA way. Some people don't want to deal with that. They want a pure, S, you know, pure, the pure C++ way or a pure FPGA way. And the whole idea of that PISM, PISM mapping is once you understand the concepts of how something works, you can apply it in all these other environments. So now we'll talk about the specifics of time service. Next on. So uh, next slide. So again, we're going to go through this. I won't belabor the PIM PISM specifications tremendously, but we'll go through the specifics of the concepts of timing service uh, and then how they get mapped in specific environments. And then we'll talk about the SOSA stuff. Next. So why do we have the time service? Again, you know, why do we do any of these things? Because we want portability. I want to go home at five o'clock. You know, I don't want to have to work late trying to port my application 20 different places. Uh, because of the different topologies, the different processing elements, there's lots of different ways to do things. And we have some special needs in a software-defined radio because obviously, especially a tactical radio, you have to do things with very precise timing if you're trying to do beam forming and things like that. You know, if you've got a massive delay between antenna one and antenna two, your beam's not going to go in the right direction. Also, we have to be very repeatable and very accurate on repetition. You know, it's not just that we launch the signal once correctly, we got to launch it every hop. So 
that's why we have these ideas. And then the other big thing is the last couple items there. When you implement a radio, it's really nice if whatever you're using to control time is monotonic. It never goes backwards. It always goes forwards. So that when you say things like, at time t, do this, you don't have to worry about what happens if we skip over time t because of a leap second or because of jamming or what happens if we skip backwards and now it's time t again. Uh, so we need, we really want to have that monotonically increasing time, but at the same time, we do need to have a concept of generic time. So next slide, please. Uh, so we have our uh, time service is a 1.0 uh, service is a wind forum facility that is published. It has one platform independent specification and then several ways that you could implement that, several PISMs, uh, native C++, FPGA, and SCA. It was released at the beginning of the year. And uh, we started from a pre-existing standard called the JTNC timing service. And we then clarified and expanded upon that. Uh, we had a lot of contributors uh, bringing a lot of experience into this background and going through, okay, this was where we were missing something in the expect, this is where we've extended that. Next slide, please. So again, we've got concepts. We don't talk about the specific way you implement things. We don't say, oh, this is a function that takes an N32. We just say there exists this call that does something like this. And we have a large number of things that we went through in the standard where we thought about things like, you know, does anybody really know what time it is? How do you talk about uh, the fact that my clock may not be accurate and has drift, and how do we quantify that drift? Because we kind of need to know these things. I won't belabor that point enormously, uh, but it is in the standard. So let's go through the PIM spec uh, a little bit more in depth. Next slide, please. So next slide. Uh, basically, we've got the concept of a time service that manages time. And there's lots of ways that that can be deployed in a radio, depending upon the radio needs. Uh, the simple case is one time service, one, one radio application. But you may have situations where a radio is split into two pieces that are not necessarily hard tied together. Uh, you know, they may not have the benefit of a victory backplane synchronizing everybody. So we have to allow for the idea that you may have to deal with the fact that you've got two different time ideas of time, two watches that you've got to look at. And of course, you know, we all know the saying, a man with one watch knows what time it is, a man with two watches is never sure. And then of course, the last one is, we may have many radio applications all looking at the same time service if we've got a platform that hosts many functions at the same time. Next, please. So again, just like we said in the previous example, we've got the idea that a radio application, which could have many components, those components can talk to different facades, which live on the different processing nodes. And that could be, again, GVP, FPG, FPGA. And they all then talk to, hope you know, it, within one time domain, a common background, a common concept of time. Again, this is very much more like <clears throat> the model in Victory and everything else. Uh, we do have some situations, though, some of the radios we support that don't have that. And like I said, they have many, many concepts of platform time because they've got many disjoint systems. Okay, next time. Next slide, please. One of the key ideas we have is this concept of system time. You know, that's the time that the world agrees upon, best estimate of universal coordinated time. Um, but we reckon, you know, and again, in, in a perfect world, everybody's on UTC and life feels good. But it's always going to be an error. There's always going to be an estimate. I'm always going to have my idea of UTC, which isn't the perfect platonic ideal of UTC that we'd see in Boulder, Colorado. And the timing service may need to adjust that I estimate of system time at any moment. Uh, because we just synced up. You know, we just got switched on. We looked around. Oh, there's the satellites. That's what time it is. 
because of jamming. You know, we may have been jammed and suddenly we're not jammed or, you know, because we were in a tunnel and we didn't see the sky, whatever. So you use system time an awful lot because especially for a military waveform, you know, how you hop has to be synchronized to everybody else. That's how you do it is by all agreeing that you're using system time. Next slide. But we said system time because it can jump around, because it can be out of sync, because it can have leap seconds, because UTC is leap seconds. And all of those things can make it very difficult to do that short-term scheduling because suddenly you're wondering about what if a leap second happens while I'm doing this. So then there's this concept of terminal time, which is just, you know, I, I always use the example, that's my Mickey Mouse watch. You know, that, you know what is terminal time relative? something it could be relative when i turn the radio on it could be relative a fixed point it could be system time um but the idea is it's a time that i don't make any assumptions about what zero means um so you really only use it for deltas and the terminal time should be synchronized across all the facades within a given time service so if I've got a platform that has one time service, all the processing elements, all the FPGAs, all the GPPs should have the same concept of terminal time. Now, I could have a system, like I said, that's split up into multiple pieces and multiple time domains that aren't synchronized. It makes life difficult, but it is something that can happen. So at any given time, we can say that there's a delta between terminal time and system time. But we do have, you know, and it's a matter of establishing what that is when we need it. But we do have this constraint. Terminal time is always monotonically increasing. It never goes back in time. We might slew how fast it runs for reasons, for synchronization or disciplining. But we're never going to skip, you know, we're never going backwards and we're not going to jump over a time in the sense of jumping over a time. Now, you know, time is quantized. You know, we might miss it because we didn't look at it, but it's always monotonically increasing. And that's to make doing software and hardware easier. Next slide, please. So now we got to tie these two together. And one of the things that we do is periodically in our wave, in our design, we create what I like to call points of congruence between terminal time and system time. We say, okay, at Mickey Mouse Watch time FF back B, it was, you know, 3 January 2023, 0300 UTC. And that concordance will last, that congruency will last for some period of time. Might be a second, might be a day, might be a year. Uh, Periodically, we reaffirm that, and we then use terminal time for our short-term time planning because it doesn't go back in time. And this is an example of how we do it. We, we calculate, okay, I want this to happen at this time in the future system time. I make that point of congruence right now. Here's now for system time. That much further ahead of time is going to be when I want this to happen. So it's that much further ahead in system time. So this terminal time is when I'm going to fire off that event. Next slide, please. We have several services within the platform independent model for accessing and getting these things. We have a service for getting terminal time, for getting system time. We have this concept of application time, which is something that needs to track and run that isn't terminal time, isn't system time, it's something else. Uh, that could be TAI time, or it could be you know, anything, you know, swatch time, who cares? Something that the application feels is necessary, it can say to the term, timing service, track this for me, please. Um, we have a few other services I won't go into great detail on. One of the things you will notice there is the TBD, the timers. Uh, I was hoping to get into this spec, the concept of things like, like programmable inter -time, interval timers, things that say you make an event happen every X period of time, but we ran out of time and that was shelved for a later event. Next slide, please. 
So the essential services group, the things that if you don't have this, why even have a time service? Terminal time and system time, and then app time and everything else are optional. So the first two, terminal and system time, are really important. Okay, next slide, please. So platform specific guide. Uh, next plat. Next slide, please. I won't. I won't belabor this point. We have define things for native C, FPGA, uh, SCA. We've identified that it, if anybody asks, we could do other platform specific models for the time service, such as native C or uh, minor adaption to Red Hawk or even things like BDS or everything else. Um, we, anybody could come up with their own platform specific model. That's why we define it this way, but Obviously, if you come up with your own little special PISM, only you are going to be able to program for that little special PISM, and that kind of blows the idea of compatibility and portability. Next slide, please. So now we're talking about how can we see this integrating into SOZA? So next slide, please. So our understanding of SOZA is that you have your position and time card that is doing uh, the actual time tracking and everything else. And you assign the responsibility of that estimate, best estimate of system time to that card. We wouldn't try to usurp that. What we would do is simply have the PNT card provide any timing services with here is system time. Um, then, there becomes the concept of things like, uh, what does it take to really be able to use that? I mean, you've got to have one pulse per second so you can have fast time synchronization between all of your compute resources. Uh, we've got to have a way to say, what time did that one pulse per second represent? And I think this goes to the question of the victory data bus messages for time. This is where they would show up is we would use those messages to inform any time service that was implemented within an SCA environment of what time it is. Now, one of the questions we're going to kick back to the group is, where should this live? Is this purely within an SCA environment, or is this, do we have ideas that are interesting enough to pull out of the SCA and bring into your environment? So, I'm going to pause momentarily. Does anyone want to jump in and ask a question right now on what we've gone through up to this point before I continue? Hearing none? Okay. Uh, we did have a question come in. Hold oh. on a second. It's long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Long questions are fun. Uh, I've got to make this screen here bigger so that I can see it. Okay, uh, waveform, all right, so you may have already covered this. Uh, waveform network time can move backwards, 15 minutes max, et cetera. Agree that TT and ST are rate monotonically increasing, but can the application specific time, the waveform network time, be allowed to handle it if a backward time shift if the network reference time, uh, which may come over the air from another node, needs to? Right, so system time and app time could theoretically click backwards. The only thing we make the monotonic requirement on is terminal time. It doesn't look like there's any follow-up, so I guess that covers it. Okay, okay. So, okay. People should so, feel free also if they want to uh, discuss this in voice because in this in this section we sort of are starting to move into a discussion mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking for back and forth because we have a lot to learn about the social services and how things embed in it. Um, you know, these last couple slides are sort of taking what we know. We've talked about that for a long time and um, give our understanding of SOSA, we also can talk about a little bit more towards the work, the collaborative work on a different group between 
SOSA and a comms mo modality and how that fits in, but ultimately, um, you know, the questions we want to move into discussing is um, how do we reconcile the, you know, the differences in approaches and uh, also possibly, you know, what can this bring in, um, you know, based on the findings of the comaps to um, any influence on the uh, SOSA timing service. So uh, Nick Porton has his hand up, so I'm going to turn his microphone on. Go ahead, Nick. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. So I love that you guys are doing this. This is this is great, and I can definitely see that we need to kind of uh, square up a little bit more on our understandings of each other. I'll say one of the big things with the the SOSA. Um, time and frequency service, right? Since that's a SOSA module, it's not necessarily defined to be any particular style of implementation, whether that be, you know, hardware from a PNT card or software being the, you know, the various PISMs from the uh, Wireless Innovation Forum. Those are all potential implementation styles. And I think the big thing that we're going to have to figure out is, you know, what would be the, I'll say, the external looking um, interfaces that you provide to the rest of the ecosystem with the Wireless Innovation Forum's timing service versus the styles of um, interactions that we would like from the SOSA time and frequency service versus what victory provides because victory is another shall we say an implementation method it is not directly adopted by sosa yet for this particular sosa module so i just want to try to clear that up a little bit and that there's there's some very interesting nuances in terms of how sosa defines these things that probably it's we'll, we'll yet to see how well they work in the grand scheme of things, but it's not quite as clear as your guys's PIM and PISM approach. And maybe SOSA needs to maybe start to document things more along those lines to make it clear. Right. Um, you know, one thing to remember about the uh, uh, WinF uh, services, it's waveform facing or application facing. Uh, it doesn't specify, for example, how it comes up with its exact concept of system time and terminal time. Um, it, uh, it, you know, talks about in the uh, standard on how these come from various time sources. It doesn't specify how potentially multiple time sources are reconciled with each other in coming up with the concept of system time. And so that's an opportunity that's that's open. Um, yep. The part that you know it wants to express as no surprise is that system time is the best representation at a particular point of time of you know what the correct time is, uh, and it recognizes that time time sources or the weighting of time sources can change. Uh, GPS and other sinks can be come and go. Uh, you may, in some cases, uh, discipline clocks. You may not. Um, and so, as as you know, and I know this is a little uh, redundant, is you could almost put the time service in a nutshell and say it ties to reconcile this changing concept of system time with something that hardware elements can actually measure against. And that's something in the case of timing service is the terminal time. The terminal time is really has very few requirements. It doesn't talk about how accurate can, it has to be. The only requirement is it has can't have stepwise discontinuities, and that's for a lot of good reasons, especially when software and uh, FPGA-based timers are involved. Where when you trigger an event to go in the future, if the time happen, if system time happened to jump over that future trigger interval, it would have undefined behavior. So. 
Uh, in short, terminal time is the realm of the hardware and the common denominator across a implementation platform. And system time is the ideal, and it pretty much in popular usage, it's always referred to as an offset between the two. Um, so f f first of all, does, does that make sense? And then we can talk a little bit about maybe, um, do we want to go to the next slide, perhaps? This would well, sort of Right. Okay, I, I will say that does make an awful lot of sense, and it it certainly certainly acknowledges the the reality of these systems, which is exceptionally important. Right. It's just a matter of where where do we fold that in appropriately in SOSA. So yeah. Yeah, and that's why we're here and why we're presenting this. You know, this is, you know, we you know, we don't claim to have all the answers. Sometimes all we have is questions. And things like <clears throat> terminal time. My mental model from where I come from tends to be terminal time is like just a 64-bit counter register over yonder that's counting up at some fixed clock rate, you know, counting up at, you know, 10 million counts a second or whatever you know, whatever my count rate is or my necessary precision. And inside my hardware, you know, I do things like, okay, launch this signal when that register is equal to, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A, B, C, D, E, F. And, you know, that is a very internal thing to a piece of hardware. And the question is, where do you want to make that be your problem? You know, do you want that internal level of things to be a big problem for SOZA? Or do you want to simply acknowledge that hardware will have something like that inside of it? We're not going to tell you how to do it, how to interact with it, what it is, what the numbers should be. But here are the rules you follow when you try to go from that hardware register to system time. And those rules, curiously enough, look an awful lot like the, the WinF timing service. Over. Yep, rog Roger that. Yeah, I'm not sure if we'll necessarily be able to get to any answers in this particular forum, but I think, you know, being able to clear clear some of these things up and have you um, have us understand each other, I think we're we're making good progress there. Can we? Um, what what we have here is we have. A, you were looking at the first of three slides. Um, the second slide sort of talks about from the standpoint of, if you may, what a SCA waveform would need. And then the third slide is, I think, where we want to spend most of our discussion time, right. which is Good. how to map those. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, oh, okay. So we want to go to that that slide. I, okay. I was go, go, let's go back one. I was going to go to that. I, I meant to go. I think we advanced, double advanced there. Again, that's the problem with being not monotonically in advancing through the slides. <laughs> okay. Um, why, don't, why don't I talk to this? Is um, if you look at, you know, one of the things, and as we will state on the next slide, we can really see. A couple places where the time facility could come in in a SOSA system. This first one addresses this very specific need of just what we would need to make SCA waveforms run. Okay, so, so SCA waveforms, um, you know, many of them are tactical based waveforms. Uh, they all run on top of this time um, facility. So as a result of this, is However, we do it in a SOSA platform, we need to come up with these concepts. Even if the concept is as simple as we've defined terminal time and system time is always having an office set of zero, and it's up to the platform to just um, make that true somehow. You know, that's one possible mapping, but you can see the potential complexity there. Um, so the waveforms used basically the JITNIC or the WinF time facility. Uh, the WinF time facility has capabilities that the JITNIC time service does not. However, they both work on the same uh, underlying concepts of system time, terminal time, and the offset between the two of them. Uh, they, 
you know, and so the, the, the needs and feeding of that at that base level is the same. A plug in cards, um, we're anticipating, and I believe this is consistent with the uh, interactions that I've uh, heard both between the WinF and within uh, JITNIC and uh, SOSA is uh, having an SDR plug-in card uh, that would most likely be running with a container. Uh, and that plug-in card internal to in a black box part of that would probably have a, a time service implementation. And depending on what the platform as a whole, the native uh, SOSA time support is the shimming of that service to the uh, hardware in the black backplane could be somewhere between uh, trivial, you know, as in if all concepts were aligned or complex if there was a, a more complicated mapping. Um, there's two things that's really important, I think, for SOSA to note in talking about the limited case of the plug-in card. First of all, in a limited case of the plug-in card, the time service does not necessarily, uh, it would only be included within a comms plug-in card, and it wouldn't be involved in any way or selecting or blending or determining the best time source. It's a consumer of that time available in a platform, and it just is a mapping problem. Um, and, um, you know, that's just a disclaimer going on. So don't, for doing that, you know, doesn't require redefining any uh, Victory or SOSA interfaces at that level. However, it doesn't mean that to get a more native napping or to possibly uh, expand out and uh, use the time service in a broader context in terms of po potentially influencing those APIs, that's probably best up for discussion. Next slide. This gets, this slide is basically, I think, where we want to spend all our uh, discussion time on. And first, I have some questions um, to the SOSA participants um, for our understanding. Um, I haven't found any particular rules on the behavior of the black backplane clock. Uh, and in particular, does the backplane clock um, in combination with the one pulse per second, does that represent a mono, strictly monotonically increasing time or can the one pulse per second alignment against that clock have discontinuities? So at this point in time, we do not have any, um, I'll say, stipulations along those lines in the in the SOSA standard. We've we've standardized on those two clocks that are put across the back plane. They are primarily intended for, I'll say like, you know, basic back back plane infrastructure uh, stuff. So, you know, a root clock for a processor, for instance, or being able to get PCIe or Ethernet links up and running. It is not directly tied to the SOSA 6.7 timing service. Ah. Although some implementations could choose to do that, but SOSA itself is divorced from potential um, implementation methods on one side versus the modules on the other. So ah, the, okay. the timing service module in one system may use that back plane clock as its means. Another SOSA mod or a module implementation in a different system may choose to use the coax connections in the uh, Vita 6667 apertures. It's uh, the, the, those styles of implementation diversity are allowed within SOSA. Okay, okay that's that's very informative. Uh, well, can I ask a side question on that? Um, how does this re relate to Mora time and to the, I'm going to say Mora um, data message. I know that SOSA, I think, has a different name to the same concept of an MDM. Uh, it has, for example, a uh, pulse per second um, MDM. 
that describes it. Are those related in any way to the back plane uh, one pulse per second, or is that not formally tied? That that is not formally tied. In terms of okay. Mora, Mora has been adopted for the 2.x SOSA modules. So the two front end modules that we have, right. the uh, emitter, right the, the right, the very front end aperture, emitter collector, and then the uh, receiver exciter. Uh, beyond that, um, we really don't have anything strictly called out yet. And okay. the 6.7 module is still on the docket to get um, the specificity that's required to to even use it properly. So those are those are uh, those still haven't haven't been uh, published at all yet. And uh, I think that's about as far as we can go in this forum. Okay. Well, no, that's that's that makes perfect sense. And in a way, it's you know it's good to hear because it means that uh, we do have some great opportunities for discovery and. You know, the, there may be opportunities where the WinF spec can inform that or uh, even be used as part of an API. It sounds to me, I just want to make an observation here, given from my particular background. Uh, and I want to ask um, my background is test and measurement. So I've got a lot of background in PXI and uh, a follow on standard of that called AXI, not to be confused with AXI from Xilinx. Um, and Again, in those protocols, you have, again, a similar concept of a backplane, a one pulse per second signal, distributed clocks and everything else. And it sounds to me, uh, this is very similar. And especially since Pixie and Axie are very similar to OpenVPX. So I wanna just say, does that sound, if you've got any experience with Pixie or Axie, does it sound like I'm, we're in sync on that? Um, I, I don't know enough about Pixie or that form of Axie to really be able to comment, sure. but I, I'm quite, quite probably they are. I mean, it, like I said before, the 6.7 module, which is, you know, kind of the, the root of Sosa's sense of time, you know, it is, it is not explicitly tied to those backplane signals or any physical signals at this point in time. And that's that's open to to the various implementation methods possible, even going so far as to say there aren't any physical signals, and it's all just um, you know the victory style network network time. It all just depends on what class of system and level of performance is necessary. So SOSA leaves leaves that open to some of the choices that are on our menu. Right. I, 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 I saw, you know, I looked at uh, more a fair amount and I know there was discussions in the beginning. I assumed that more would be used in conjunction, let's say when moving to a radio head with uh, PTP um, for the victory specs. But then I also have heard discussion about uh, um, in most cases, radio heads would be provided with the backplane reference clock and one pulse per second, which led me to think that you know there may be some relation to that. So that's I think an area of exploration to go forward on. Another sort of obvious, uh, well to me it seems like a natural mapping of whatever timestamps Mora uses. They feel to us, you know, when we look at our SDR platforms. Um, they feel very similar to terminal time in that, you know, in terminal time, when you say something will trigger at a given time, T, um, it's assumed that even if better estimate of time happens to so-called system time, the terminal time is running monotonic. It can be disciplined, you know, as long as the, the so the slope can be subtly changed to keep things in sync, but, terminal time T will always happen on that. And that's sort of an obvious, to me, mapping to um, Mora time concepts, in which case perhaps Mora is not specified as UTC time, but as uh, terminal time. Uh, 
just just some thoughts yeah i i think that may be a very astute observation that we're going to have to explore further and another thing i'll want to point out is that uh you know, in terms of like a lot of the radiohead specification aspects of things some of those may be more uh cmos in nature than sosa per se that's which, possible which at times can be really, really difficult to tease apart because the two are do have a lot of crossover, right? There is a strong Venn diagram relationship there. So it's uh it's uh it it's it's a good thing, but it also can cause some confusion once in a while as, as well. Right. We've had a, a question come in from the audience from Rob Sklut. Uh, it says, for most all existing JTRS waveform applications, the notion of platform time, which I think is uh, backplane time here uh, concept, uh, is operated in a manner that the time advertised is at the next one PPS. Can this be supported? Um. Dave, I'll, I'm going to let you cover that okay. uh, just because you just went through that. Well, again, so if I understand that, um, one of the things is the concept that, okay, you're one pulse per second fired, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, and then somebody says at the tone the time will be. Well, is it at the tone the time will be or at the tone the time was? And so in a lot of the cases, and that was one of the things that we went through in the spec was the concept of if you ask, you know, what will be the, what will be the system time and terminal time for the next pulse? Um, and yes, that can be supported, obviously, you know, whenever you're talking about a pulse in the future, you know, you're making an estimate as to when the pulse is uh, versus uh saying okay at the last pulse you know the idea of here was system time here's this terminal time and when the pulse comes through we latch that terminal time and create that point of congruence between the amount system time and the terminal time but yeah projecting forward is you know it, it is possible and one of the things i would suggest if anyone's interested we do have this spec published we go through an awful lot of interesting things in this spec because we talk about things like, okay, I have my terminal time, which runs, maybe it's a little slow because my oscillator is cheap or fast. Uh, so its rate, its slope might not be one second to you know, one second real time to one second counted time. And then you've got questions about how does your uncertainty in terminal time grow over time? How does your uncertainty in system time grow over time? We mentioned briefly here the time figure of merit, TFOM. Um, there are things about how do you age TFOM if uh, I have a current estimate of system time and then my source of system time stops giving me data. You know, I just drove into a tunnel. You know, my, est my error estimate's going to start growing over time until something comes in and redisciplines it. And this, these, all of these things are described in the standard, and they may be very interesting reading for people because trying to go through and qualify, you know, does anybody know what time it really is, to quote Chicago? Uh, you know, try to quantify all that, get very interesting problems sometimes, over. Yeah, and I'm just gonna take, maybe add one thing, uh, Rob, in that I view the, if you made the, um, let's say it's a GPS or a GNSS, the type receiver that's providing is one pulse per second. Typically in the SDR implementations I've seen, that logically is flowing into the timing service. And then from the timing service through the waveforms communicating off to the uh, their DSP and FPGA implementations, that usually is done on a terminal time. So for example, if I'm in the, uh, layer one implementation code, I'm probably not doing anything in the general case with one pulse per second. I'm doing things at that point with terminal time and timing service probably has a synchronization FPGA that on the one pulse per second, it takes snapshots of that terminal time and that's used by the timing service to produce that offset, if that helps. Over. 
Do you hear me? This is Eric speaking from Paris. Um, a suggestion at this stage, because we're nearing the conclusion, to me, it might be valuable that we explore um, what would be in a common verbiage, the issue is having a common verbiage, to explain what would be the value and the architectural layout we would reach in combining, and I talk about combining, not about replacing, improving, or whatever. It, really, it would really be, in my, the way I see things, exploring the value of combining the virtues of SOSA and as it is today, plus referencing or recognition of the Wind Forum uh, standards that could uh, help, not improve, but supplement what SOSA is currently doing with these uh, fundamentally speaking, let's say, abstraction layers or implementation abstract uh, APIs that are here, as Chuck said, to help the life of the waveform developer and, uh, and save time of all waveform developers if we combine them into some well-designed facades running on top of SOSA. And uh, I believe it would be worth, that's my suggestion, that we prepare for some next interactions, uh, some, uh, some briefs, capturing those ideas, trying to uh, expose the potential value and the way those complements, the way they are not competing against each other, but they are really uh, uh, bringing to each other, and, and then perhaps have a, a meeting discussing that again. And I am personally absolutely certain that there is a way, feasibility is not at stake, the question is, do we make, does it make sense? Do we believe it creates values for our communities? And that's what we might be ready to explore. Over. Thanks, Eric. Um, this is Ken. Um, maybe Nick, next week we have a face-to-face -face meeting. We can talk a little bit more about um, the path forward and try to lay that out a little bit on how we kind of bring these two things together. Or at least- Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's gonna be gonna be the way to go. Um, I, I, I do think there's a lot of importance in terms of, you know, whether it's direct reuse, whether it's defining a mapping that people can use or or however, whatever path forward, right? I mean, the, the concepts that you guys have are important and necessary. I've seen them used, maybe not necessarily by these exact names, but all over the place. So it's great. You guys have some wise design choices in terms of this. So how to properly reflect that back in SOSA, I think it's just a matter of how that happens, frankly. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any other questions, either from the people, you know, the attendees or the panelists have anything else that they'd want to bring up? I'm not seeing any new questions typed in, so I, uh, I, I think we're, uh, I think we're good there. Okay. Um, given that. I want to thank everybody for attending the webinar. I hope that you found this useful and informative. And I want to thank Eric and David and Chuck for your participation in presenting the material. I think it was a really good conversation and it gives us a lot to think about going forward. Okay, thank you everyone. And uh, we will work to get uh, the recording and slides posted later today so folks can review them again at their leisure. Uh, and with that, we'll talk with everyone next time. Been a pleasure, guys. Yes, thank you much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.